Praise the Lord. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've been facing some battles. Anybody facing battles? Whether it be sickness, mental, emotional, financial, whatever it may be. But I believe that the Lord is trying to show us something because Ever since Monday night prayer, we started to fast, we started to pray. We have been experiencing difficulties. Remember the old television uh, stations when they would have difficulties, they would have that little sign that came up, and, it, and then you hear this little boop, and it would say we're experiencing technical difficulties. Well, can I say that we are experiencing technical difficulties because we are having awesome prayer meetings. You know, as Cam was saying, he said that, you know, when he came, we saw maybe five or ten people here. Now we're getting over 20, and they're coming out to prayer, and we're seeking him and only him. We're not seeking for things. We're not seeking for uh, answers to uh, our prayers. We're seeking him and his presence. And I can tell you, and I'm, I'm not lying to you, that every single time we've come together on Monday night, his presence is manifested. And even more and more and more, and we're excited about that because that's what we're here for. We're here for him. Amen? Praise God. So I want to share with you this morning the battle cry and igniting a passion for Christ and how we need to make sure that our fire is burning for the Lord. And not to get burnt out. That's one of the enemy's tactics. And uh, I'm going to share with you from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 this morning. So if you have your Bibles, please open them. And uh, also pray for those who are not here this morning. I know Joe's back is not feeling well. So uh, he texts me, so pray for him uh, to press through. Amen? <clears throat> you know, I mean, we all have aches and pains and, you know, we all uh, have difficulties, but... You know, we press through those things, and uh, he's still a young Christian, and he needs to um, be encouraged to press through those things. Amen. We want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you this morning. Good to have you with us. And uh, Sister Linda up in Maine, and also uh, Sajeev in India. And uh, please pray for my visa. I filed for an electronic visa, hoping to get that soon so that we can go to India in September, end of September. Praise God. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, if you have your Bibles with you. The Apostle Paul is speaking to the Corinth church. Now, understand the Corinth church at times became very carnal. In fact, many times Paul had to rebuke them and get them straight. They were using the gifts of God in the flesh, and they were doing all kinds of fleshly things that were going on. And Paul said that they were babes, they were, in, they were in need of having teachers all over again because they were handling the word of God as little babies. And how many, uh, have here, here, how many here this morning, you know, you've been around for a long time. You've been a Christian for a while. And we're no longer babies, and God wants us to be mature and wants us to be able to uh, fight our battles and not just quiver in a corner somewhere. Amen? So the Apostle Paul is directing the, his second letter to Corinth, and he says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Amen? We're not ignorant of his devices. I have to kind of stay here this morning because uh, Bobby's got Sunday school and he's not operating the camera. So he says, you're only allowed to go here and there. You can't go beyond that point. That's going to be very difficult for me this morning because you know how I like to interact and go around. But anyway, I'll try my best. They tell you in Bible college to stay behind the pulpit. I'm sorry I can't do that. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. The Apostle Paul, who was a tremendous man of God, included himself in the plural here. He says, lest Satan get an advantage of us. And he was including himself. Some think the Apostle Paul was invincible, but he wasn't. He was a man of like passions as you and I, and he had difficulties and, and, and struggles like you and I have. Uh, even uh, at times, you know, 
when he thought he couldn't go anymore, God told him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. It's not always being on top of the mountain that you'll win the greatest battles. It's when you're in the valley, hallelujah, and you go through with flying colors with some battle scars. Amen? Nothing like a good battle scar to remind you of who's in charge. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. And some of the ways that the enemy takes advantage over us is in the area of battling. On the battleground, in the spiritual realm. Now, we're not fighting a physical battle. We don't see physical enemies and we're knocking them out, and I hope you're not. I hope when you see somebody, you're not knocking them out if you see the devil operating through them. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, work, uh, workers of wicked and, uh, and high places. And so we, we don't fight the, the, the natural battle. We're fighting a spiritual battle. But I want to talk to you the, the battlefield in which the enemy attacks us. And the battlefield that he attacks us is our minds. He will try to convince you through other people, especially non-believers, that what you're doing in God doesn't count. Or he'll try to convince you to remove yourself from the place that God has you. Amen. He'll speak to you and try to draw you away. And that's happened to so many that have come into our ministry also as many other ministries also. When God wants you in a place, and he puts you in and establishes you in a place, the enemy will try his donest to get you out of that place. And let me say this to you, he will use logic. He will use circumstances. He will use the word I'm trying to find is he, he will use convenience. Now, I remember Linda and I at one time, when before we started the ministry, we were looking for a church, and God put a church on our, on our hearts down the Cape, down in uh, Buzzards Bay, Onset area. And that's a good 35, 35 minutes away, you know. And... Uh, we went and visited, and we felt that that's where God would have us, and we stayed there for, what, five years? We were there five years. Linda was on the mission board there, and, and I was uh, doing worship and leading worship and preaching every once in a while. But every week we traveled 35 miles at least twice a week. And then when I worked second shift, I couldn't go. Linda would take her girlfriends, and they would go. But we used to travel 35 miles every week and before that when we were living in New Bedford and we went to a, I went to Brother Cootie's and Sister Debbie and I we would travel sometimes 35 minutes to go to Bible study and we would go in snow or rain it didn't make any difference and see the thing is is that the enemy wants to stop that the enemy will attack your mind and tell you that you need to be somewhere else. That you need to be uh, in a place that's better and more convenient. But I'm, through my years of experience, and I've been with the Lord almost 40 years now, I can tell you that God has put me sometimes in the most inconvenient places and the most difficult places. And I can tell you right now, one of the most difficult places that I minister in is New Bedford. The spiritual battle that we go through, the spiritual warfare that we have to go through in our hearts and in our minds to come and to, and to battle through that, but we're still here. Amen? And I'm sure that in Chile they have their battles. And I'm sure they have their demonic manifestations. And I'm sure in Haiti they have their battles. And they have their demonic manifestations. 
I just thank God that he doesn't allow them to be manifest in America because half of America would go crazy. If half of America saw what was going on in Hades and saw the spiritual realm in Haiti, they would run for the hills. The Christians that are in many churches today, they would not be able to stand because to see, actually see demons and know that they're walking around plotting your demise. Because we don't see them, they're out of our minds. But I want you to know that the enemy, as it says here, we're not ignorant of his devices. He has devices. He has a plan. He's a military strategist. Just think for a moment the civil war in the United States. Now, there were many issues why that civil war had happened, the north against the south and so forth. But the Bible says the enemy is not flesh and blood. And just think for a moment, if people could just get a cause and fight for that cause and fight against their own brothers or their own citizens of their own country and kill them. When the Bible says the devil is a murderer from the beginning. And you look at today in the political forum. You see the Antifa, you see the, the Democrats, and you see those that are opposing, and those that are, they're, they're the ones that are violent. And they're rising up in violence. And some are saying that there could be another civil war. Well, who's behind it? It's Satan. He's the one that causes division. He's the one that is a surplanter. He's the one that's the accuser of the brethren. He's the one that comes and tries to conquer and destroy and that's why so many times you have seen Israel being attacked and attacked and attacked and attacked over and over again because Satan knows if he can get Israel, then he's got the church. Then he's got the promises of God. But I'm here to tell you this morning that he'll never, ever have Israel because just when it looks like Israel will be defeated in that final war, the Bible says the clouds shall roll back. And Jesus will come on a white horse, and he will fight for Israel one more time. But they will see him, and we, he'll win that battle of Armageddon. Hallelujah. And we will be with him. Amen? Fighting that battle. So now we're in the world, and we're in the earth, and we're here to establish practice. We're practicing these things. We're learning these things. How many know that God hates a coward? If you don't think so, read your Bible. He says, don't be fearful. Be strong and of a good courage. Courage. God wants you to have courage. You don't have to be afraid of the enemy. The only time you, you need to be afraid of the enemy if, is if you're not living right. If you're not living right, you're open to his deception. You're open to his thoughts. You're open to even him to use your mouth to speak and tear down somebody, tear down another person, tear down a ministry, tear down a pastor, tear down your brother, tear down your sister, tear down your husband, tear, tear down your wife with your words. Those are words that the enemy will give to you and you will speak them out. And you say, Pastor, I don't believe that. You need to read your Bible. When Peter, when Jesus asked the question, he said, who do men say that I am? Some said, well, you're John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. But he said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. But a little bit later on, Jesus was describing himself going to the cross. And Peter said, no, not let it not be so, Lord. Came out of Peter's mouth. No, Lord, you're not going to go to the cross and die. What did Jesus do? Did Jesus take him in the, in, the, in the corner and sit him down and give him a psychological evaluation? Did he give him a counseling session? What did he say to Peter? The Bible says he rebuked Peter and he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. He wasn't calling Peter Satan. But the words that came out of Peter's mouth 
we're from Satan. Because Satan doesn't want the cross. Satan didn't want the cross because he knew the cross would be his defeat. You say, how does he know that? Because he can read the Bible. Genesis says that he will crush his head. Come on, somebody. See, that's what's missing in a lot of Christianity today is the cross. And I should say maybe not so much missing, but replaced. It's replaced with a new cross. A new cross of, of gratifying the flesh rather than denying the flesh. He says we're not ignorant of his devices. So many, I, I have to laugh because, you know, I've been in this thing for 40 years and there are people that have gone to Bible college for four years and they think they know more than me. Four years of Bible college doesn't make them know more than me. And they go to these places, or uh, uh, people that haven't even gone to Bible college, maybe been a Christian five years, they think they know more than me. And I'm not here to boast about how much I know, but I know what I know. And I'm confident in what I know. But the problem is, is that the enemy, who has a spirit of error, there's a spirit of truth, and there's a spirit of error. And that spirit will come and speak to you and tell you, you know, God is not real. Jesus isn't real. Oh, there's something up there. There's someone out there. See, we're not ignorant of the enemy's devices. We're not ignorant of how he does it. How he does it is through teachers, professors, hello, friends. The devil uses people just like God uses people to fulfill his will. The devil will use people to fulfill his will. And he begins to speak to the minds of people and saying, you're okay. You don't need to get any more committed. You don't need to surrender that thing. God still loves you. Hello? You can continue in that sin. It's all right. God's going to still love you. Yeah, he'll love you. But if you are continually living in sin, the Bible says the love of God is not in you. 1 John. He that says walks in the light and is in darkness, he deceives himself. We're not ignorant of his devices. We're not ignorant of his devices. I got to turn that heat, that thing back on. It's getting warm up here. For some reason, it shuts itself off. Give me one minute. Praise the Lord. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we're not ignorant of his devices. Ephesians 4.14 says this, that we from this time forward be no more children. What are children? Children don't have a care in this world. Children Run and play, that's all they think about is playing. Playing and fun, having fun, playing and having fun, having fun and playing, playing, having fun, being with their friends, having fun, playing, playing, having fun. There are some Christians like that. They play with sin. Their children not understanding that that sin will kill them, will destroy them. They don't think for a moment they're like children. Being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. What is doctrine? Doctrine is teaching. What is teaching? Teachings are words, phrases, ideologies, philosophies. Where do they come from? From self, from God, and from Satan. Do you know that Satan knows how to talk? Jesus had many conversations with the devil. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. It says he was tempted there. He was brought by the Spirit of God into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And the devil spoke to him. You know what the devil used? He used the Word of God, but out of context. When he spoke to Eve in the garden, what did he use? 
the Word of God out of context. You have to be careful. Because you can take a scripture out of context and it has a totally different meaning than it originally had. And if you take two, you can be very dangerous. I'll take two. Number one, in the Bible it says, Judas went out and hung himself. And if you go to another page, it says, Go and thou do thou likewise. And people can read that out of context and see, see, God's telling me to commit suicide. No. That's why we had a, a whole course on hermeneutics on Wednesday evening. We're almost finished. I think we've got two more lessons or three more lessons on that. We'll be finished. To how to interpret the Bible, how to uh, get the Bible correctly. He says, we're not to be tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sleet of men. Notice that, men. And cunning craftiness, whereby they lay in wait to deceive. The Bible says, woe unto those who go down to Egypt for help. Can I tell you, the secular programs will not help you. Psychology won't help you. It'll help to a small degree. Non-Christian counseling will help you, but only a little bit. But you'll never, ever be free. One of the things in Alcoholics Anonymous and Drugs Anonymous, they always tell you, you'll always be an alcoholic and you'll always be an, a drug addict. You must state that. And I tell you, um, it's been 35 years that I have been free from alcohol and drugs and tobacco and can I tell you, I am no longer an alcoholic. I am no longer a drug addict. Hallelujah. God has set me free. Jesus has set me free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You don't have to be in bondage to those things that beset you. But you listen to the lie of the devil. You are listening to satanic induce, inducement of thoughts. You are yielding your spirit to those demons. When you turn your back on God and you listen to the enemy. Don't be carried about. Don't be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, teaching by the sleet of men who are cunning and crafty and they lay in wait to deceive. They're right there waiting to deceive you. Right there. They're right there. You'll find it on the internet. You'll find it on the television. You'll find it on the radio. You'll find it in your neighbor. You'll find it in one of your friends or your loved one. And they don't even realize it. That's the sad thing. They don't even realize it. They think it's their thoughts. And they're speaking these things to you. And they're not aware that you have an enemy of your soul. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. These principalities are wicked, wicked spirits that have been assigned to you. Hello? They've been assigned to you. These wicked spirits want to destroy you. They follow you every day. I'm not trying to scare you, but I'm trying to let you be aware that you may not see them. They follow you every day. And they gather information about you. And they say, hey, you know what? You know what really, really ticks them off? You know what really pushes their button? This. And 
what happens? Someone in your family, someone you know, you just found this out, and somebody you know comes and pushes that very button. And you go, and what happens? Your, your ears begin to steam. You get that look on your face. See, my wife has a certain look. I call them hawk eyes. It's when her eyebrows come together. When she gets that look, Katie, by the door, better run. That's serious business. I remember my dad when he used to correct me. All he had to do was look beyond the rim of his glasses at me like this. But the enemy follows you every day. Every day. You know, how many know demons don't need to sleep? I get attacked a lot in my sleep. I'm fighting demons sometime in my sleep. And I can always tell when Linda gets attacked in her sleep. We'll be laying in bed. It'll be late at night, maybe 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. And all of a sudden, it's like I'm sleeping next to Curly on the Three Stooges. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is true. I'll be sleeping, and I'll, I'll wake up, and I'll hear... And when she does that, I know that she's being attacked by a demon or a witch. And I'll lay my hand on her and I'll begin to pray. And sometimes she's like, <laughs> Then I'll pray for her and then she'll stop. And the next day she'll tell me, I was being attacked by a witch or a uh, I, I was looking for you, and I couldn't find you. That's not reality, because it's the other, other way around. I can never find her. <laughs> if anyone knows, if you want to go on a, on a shopping trip, go with Linda. And within two minutes, you will not be able to find her. That's how it works. But we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. I know that since this Monday night prayer, the enemy has unleashed an attack on our minds, on our physical being, on things that have happened. Friday the 13th was last Friday. How many are superstitious? You stayed home. I didn't stay home. Me and uh, Pastor Jerome and Joe, we went to the ball game. On the way back, saw a terrible accident on 140. And I heard earlier in the day there was another accident on 140. Two people were killed. The devil's sacrifice. You know, the devil receives burnt offerings too, you know. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood, principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world. The enemy has a strategic plan. We're not ignorant of his devices. He has a strategic plan to take you out. Some of the ways he uses your kids. Some of your ways he'll use your husband, your wife, to take you out. That's his plot. That's his plan. To deteriorate your body so that you will die. And you will lose your purpose and effectiveness 
and call of God in your life. You say, Pastor, I say, yeah, that's right, it's true. Look at Jonah. God tells Jonah, I want you to go to Tarsus. Where does he go? The opposite direction. I like what Cam said this morning. He says, all the doors closed. But you could have forced those doors open. And then you would have been in real trouble. And like Jonah inside the whale. And isn't it amazing that when God allows the whale to spit him up, he spits him up on the shores of where he needs to be. Praise God. Praise God. There's a battle going on. There's a battle in America. There's a battle going on in the world. But there's a battle going on in the mind. And he wants to convince you that God doesn't love you. God doesn't care. It's just a religion. You know, it's just, you, know, you don't have to get close to God. You don't need to be born again. You don't need to be spirit-filled. You don't need this. You don't need that. And he lies. And we accept that. Can I tell you? If you are not spirit-filled, you need it in these last days, or you're going to succumb. Hello? You're going to succumb. The pressure's mounting. Think about it. That which is natural is first. Then that which is spiritual. You can't even wear a Trump hat in public. I want to challenge you. Wear a Trump hat. Go walking around. You might get beat up, ridiculed, mocked. That which is natural. Now the spiritual. The enemy uses intimidation, manipulation, domination to get you to shut your mouth, to accept the things that are against God. Why? Because the devil has a plan. He has a purpose. He has a device. The device he's using right now is to bring a one-world government, a one-world church together that will be pagan, that will not be worshiping the one true God, and we that will not join that church or be a part of that church will be called heretics, will be called separatists, they will call us all kinds of names. And I receive that as a badge of honor. I was talking with somebody on Facebook, uh, and I saw uh, the sister, and, I, and there was a picture of a, uh, of a guy and his two, I don't know who they were, but behind it was the pentagram. And I told the sister, watch out, he's a Satan worshiper. Well, that guy came back on me on Facebook, and he slammed me. And I asked him, I said, he said, that was at my brother's house, and who are you to judge? And I says, and see, when somebody gets that offensive, that means I hit a nerve. You ever go to a dentist and you hit a nerve? Ooh. So when you hit a nerve, you know you hit something. So I asked him, I said, is there anybody in your family or in that picture where you had that picture taken that is a devil worship or a witchcraft. He would not answer me. By his not answering me, I know he already answered me. You see, those are things we don't play with. Those are things we don't want to indulge in. But they indulge in them all the time. The enemy has strategic minions, if I can use that word. Okay? Or strategic demons that have followed you from the day you were born and knows all your ins, your outs, your ups, your downs. He knows them all. And he knows how to trigger you. He knows what things to allow. He knows what things to, to get offended. He knows what buttons to push so that you'll turn your back on God or you'll turn your back on God's people or to isolate yourself. He knows exactly. He's a tactic professional. He knows exactly what to do. Because ultimately, he wants to destroy you. Ultimately, he wants to destroy me. 
He doesn't want me telling you what I'm telling you this morning. You understood the mental battle that I've had this last few days. Say, but yeah, yo, pastor. No, it has nothing to do with that. I'm still a Christian. I'm still a human being. I still got to fight the same good fight of faith that you do. I got to fight that good fight of faith. I got to push down flesh. I've got to put down every thought and every evil imagination and take it into captivity to the obedience of Christ. The problem is, and we were talking the other day, uh, as we were going to the ball game, we, and we were talking about the Chinese and the Japanese and, and why they're so successful. And the one word that came to me was because they're disciplined. In America, we're not disciplined. That scripture in Corinthians that says, casting down imaginations and bringing into captivity some thoughts. Is that what it says? No, every thought. Every thought. Because the thoughts that sometimes we think that are ours, they're not ours, they're Satan's. And he wants to come to kill and destroy your call, your purpose in life. Some people say to me, well, you know, I go to church, but I don't have no friends. Well, make yourself friendly. Come on. You don't have friends because you don't make yourself friendly. You don't get involved. You come into church, you run out, out of church. You come into church, you run out of church. You want friends? Make friends. Fellowship. Develop good, solid friendships. The Bible says if you don't show yourself friendly, guess what? You're not going to have friends. I've always done that in my, all my life. If I see somebody alone or I see somebody separate or I see somebody aside no one's paying attention to, I go to that person. I include them. That's what we're supposed to do. But oh no, we want to have our little independency. You know, we want to have our own little, little box we live in. God didn't call you to live in a box. Hello? God never called you to live in a box. Fellowship with one another. Call one another. Invite one another over for dinner. Go out for lunch with somebody. Get involved with somebody. Otherwise, church just becomes a club. Like BJ's. You just join the club, pay your dues, and then you go home. Right? No, we're to interact with each other. We're part of the body. You say, well, pastor, I don't have anything. You have crackers? I'm not fussy. You got animal crackers? I'll take that. <laughs> but interact with each other. See, the devil wants to separate, get you feeling lonely, get you feeling depressed. I tell people all the time, listen, you want to come over to my house? Just call and say, are you available? Can we come by for a visit? And if, if I'm not doing anything important, I say, sure, come on by. Now, this is something I want you to understand. God answers our prayer. Hear me now. God answers our Even when we think it's the stupidest thing, but we pray God answers our prayer. Linda and I came back from Chinese last night, and we're sitting in the house, and I said to my wife, I said, you know what, honey, we don't have anything chocolate. <laughs> I said, why don't you go? Why don't you go to a uh, market basket and get some, you know. She says, I'm not going to market basket this late at night. Now, I don't know if you want to call that a prayer or not. <laughs> it was a request, which is a prayer. But my wife wouldn't do it. And about a half an hour later, I get a text. It was Ariana. And she says, Pastor, can I come by and drop something off for you? I said, sure. About a, 20 minutes later, half hour later, she comes rings the doorbell. I get up, I go there. And what does that little angel of God <laughs> have in her hands? 
She has a bag from Greg's Bakery with a huge, all-inclusive chocolate cake. And she didn't even know it. But she fulfilled a wish and a desire and a prayer of her pastor. And so if any of you ever feel like are inspired to bring lobster <laughs> or steak or anything like that, please feel free and be moved by the Spirit. And I'll tell you, I had a piece of that chocolate cake. And it was so good. God knows what you have need of. That was already in motion before I had said, Lord, you know, I would really like a piece of chocolate. And I said, Linda, why don't you go to Market Basket and get the chocolate? And she said, no, I'm not going over here Market Basket. It's too late to go to Market Basket. But God didn't want to use her. God wanted to use her and Mama. So thank you for that chocolate cake. And we have extra if anyone wants to come and have a piece. I want to read, in closing, I want to read Psalm 121. It says, I will, say I will. It's a matter of your will. Many people say I won't. But if you want God's blessings, you'll have an I will in your vocabulary. I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence comes my help. As God is teaching Cam to get his eyes off of people and circumstances and situations and put his eyes fully on him, and as he went, he didn't wait for all the money, but as he went, that's faith in, in initiated, God supplies. God brings it in. Amen? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Do you have PayPal? Okay. If you can text me that information. Um, so how's the, how's the uh, monetary system according to ours? Is it worth more or less or is our more or less? Okay. Praise the Lord. So you got my text, my number, right? Well, see me after church. I'll give it to you. And uh, we'll, we'll send you a little something as the Spirit of God provides. My help comes from the Lord. No one else, no person, no institution, but from the Lord, which made the heavens and the earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved he that keeps you will not sleep. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from, time, from this time forth, even forevermore. The battlefield or the battle cry that God is saying, it's time to rise up, take your position, and stop allowing the devil to walk all over you and to make you defeated and to make you a non-effective Christian by your witness. Because if you expect people to look at your life and be saved, Genuinely saved. I'm not talking about these fly-by-nighters. I'm talking about to be genuinely saved. See, something happened in me almost 40 years ago. 
that changed my life. Something happened in you 10, 15, 20, 5, whatever many years it was, that changed your life. There has to be a change. There has to be a change. And if there is not a change in your life, then you're not saved. And you need to be saved. If you don't have the desire for God or the zeal for God that you once had when you were first saved, then you've lost your first love. If you've lost that zeal, will you go anywhere for the Lord? Will you do anything for the Lord? I want you to know I told the Lord the other day. Notice I told him. I said, Lord, I'm tired. I'm tired of traveling overseas. You have to understand, you know, it's, it takes a toll on your body. I believe there's a 12-hour difference in India. And, and uh, I was going to go to India for 12 days and then Nigeria for seven days. And then I said, Lord. And then Bishop told me that that week will not work. We have to figure something else out. So I said, you know what? That's a sign to me not to go to both. You'll be so worn out. So I said, Lord, I'm 62 years old. Like he didn't know that. <laughs> and Lord, to travel all those miles, to sit in that airport for those hours, it's very hard to sleep on a plane when you have babies screaming and crying. You know, and you can't give them Benadryl because, you know, I think every parent that has a child should carry Benadryl. <laughs> and you give the baby a little Benadryl, that baby will fall right to sleep. No harm, no foul. But just going through that, going through the time change, then going there, and it's daytime there, and it's night here. So I'm used to sleeping here, and now you have to be awake over there. And, and vice versa. Going through the time change is one thing. Then going to village to village, from village to village, going in the car. And what would take us maybe five minutes to go from here to BJ's, it takes an hour and ten minutes by, by automobile in India because of the people and the congestion and the, and the road conditions and, and so much more. And then you have, you, have to, you have to go through the weather and the rain or whatever happens. you got all that going on. And, and what I'm saying to you is, is that when your life is given to Christ, it's not what you want. Hello? As Cam said, I was planning to go there two months and come home. God has another plan. And it's sad that so many Christians because they're afraid of the battle. They're afraid to get involved in the fight. They're afraid to go. They're afraid to go on the mission field. I'm telling you, you go on the mission field one time, it will change your life. You won't come back the same. And if you do, then maybe you should be waterboarded or something. I don't know. You might have a hard, hard heart. But you go on the mission field, you'll never be the same again. That changed me when you go on that mission field and you see the souls that have absolutely nothing, nothing, and yet have a fire and a fervency for God, and they'll go out and they'll evangelize and they'll tell people about Jesus. And I'm not just talking about pastors and evangelists. I'm talking about everyday Christians. And they'll go out there on the corner with their Bible and they'll start preaching the gospel and they're ridiculed and mocked, and some of them are hit, and stones are thrown at them, or, or they get ostracized from their families. This is real, folks. And you're in a battle, 
And God is calling us to battle. Don't give up. Don't give in. Do not surrender. I don't want to see any white flags in your hand. If I see it in the spirit, I'll go knock it out of your hand. You're not going to you're not going to surrender because we're going to surround you with prayer. We're going to surround you. Hallelujah. We're going to praise God. We're going to bind the devil in Jesus name. We're going to break this atmosphere over this city. We're going to take it for God. Hallelujah. We're going to be a powerful move if we'll only pay the price. Amen. So you're called to the battlefield. When you called in the army, if you remember in the 60s and we had the draft, when your number was called, you didn't go and say, oh, excuse me, I don't feel like going. Uh, excuse me, uh, I, I got to go do this. I got something to do. No, when you got called, you were called. And you had to go. And you had to serve. How much more the army of God? God's got an army. Are you in that army? How many of you how many of you are in that army? Stand up. Say, I want to be in this army. I'm in the army of the Lord. God doesn't want cowards. I'm in the army of the Lord. You are enlisted. You've already been enlisted when you said this in this prayer, so you can't turn back. Can I tell you this? You know how the army has two years, four years? In God's army, there's no getting out. Once you sign, oh, you can run in AWOL, go AWOL, okay? But when you go AWOL, make sure that the devil will be chasing you too. Amen? So let's pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, come on, pray with me. Heavenly Father, I'm in a battle. I'm not in a losing battle. Because your word says that you cause us to triumph in you always. We have the victory. We have the ammunition. We have the armor. We have the shield. We have the sword. And Lord, help us to fight the spiritual battle of apathy, of lethargy, of compromise, of lukewarmness. And God, help us to stand in these last days, having done all to stand, having the full armor of God, ready for battle, no retreat, but for advancement. And we thank you that you have chosen us in these last days to represent you on the front lines of this battle. We declare, Satan, you are defeated, not by might, not by my power, but by his spirit. You were defeated on the cross over every vice, over every sin, that I've committed. I've been free by the Son of God. No more to be plagued by those things that bind. But whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And I thank you for the freedom. And I am now a freedom fighter. And I will be my brother's keeper, my sister's keeper. And I will stand strong in these last days. In Jesus' name, amen. Give the Lord a clap offering this morning. Now, Father, be with them. Surround them with your holy angels and protect them as they go their separate ways. Lord, bless their going in. They're lying. They're coming out. They're lying down. They're rising up. And I pray, God, that you be a real blessing to them today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We greet one another before you.